Hello, I'm Eric Snodgrass, and thank you for watching today's long-range technical forecast video for Australia, brought to you by Nutrient Ag Solutions. This analysis is being provided for perspective only, and any decision made based upon this presentation is the sole responsibility of the person making the decision. Finally, please remember that all long-range weather forecasting is speculative by nature. We're going to start with an international perspective here. I'm going to take you straight to the west coast of the United States. This satellite image has several dark black blotches here in parts of California and Oregon, and what those are... Those are where we have fires raging here across the western part of the United States. As the sun rises on this animation, you can see the extent of the smoke we're dealing with here on the uh, western side of our mountain ranges, and you can see it extending out of the Pacific Ocean. Normally, the winds come out of the west and race across this part of the country, blowing the smoke to the east, but in this particular situation, the air quality here in California is horrible. One of our bigger cities here on the west coast, San Francisco, looked like this today. You can see here that as the smoke went over top of the city, it filtered out a lot of the sunlight, only allowing some of the, the long wavelength light, like the reds, to get through. So pretty eerie situation here uh, along the west coast of the United States. Now the bigger feature that's causing this is actually a little bit to the east of there. And I'm going to show you the surface temperature map for our high hit temperatures today. So remember, it's still summer here uh, in, in the United States, and normally the temp temperatures right in through this area are in the 90s. But instead today, our high temperatures were in the 40s in terms of degrees Fahrenheit, which puts it about 50 degrees cooler than normal. There's a deep upper level low spinning over our four corner states, which are found right here where they all intersect. And that upper level low brought snow and a big frost event about a month earlier than normal into this region over the last 24 hours. And this certainly impacted a lot of our crops. Now, why I'm addressing this is because of where that upper level low is going to be going over the coming days. So this is a precipitation map, and that low is going to go from here right through the central plains of the United States toward the Great Lakes, which are here. And this corridor in through here, especially as you get into the southern plains, I'll put a box around it right in through there, we grow a lot of wheat in through this area. Now it's approaching the winter wheat planting time period for us. And if we get a big rain that comes through like this and then some drier weather, this is going to do two things. One, there's going to be accelerated planting of our winter wheat. Great to get it germinating. Two, pasture growth, which means what uh, positive things for our, our cattle industry industry will be the result of some of these heavy rains after they pass through. So I want to keep an eye on that. Now, speaking of rains, there is a place here in the Northern Hemisphere that's not getting it, and that is over here around the Black Sea. So the Black Sea is located right here. Look at the Southern Russian wheat belt. Look at Ukraine over the next 15 days where we are showing drier than normal conditions in through this particular area. In fact, those drier conditions extend back here from Poland uh, through Germany and France as well. Up around Moscow, for example, those wheat fields right now are looking quite wet. But there's a lot of concern that over the last month, this particular region has been very dry. Let me show what I'm talking about. Coming back to a similar map, but now looking at percent of normal precipitation over the last 30 days, this region right in through here, as you can tell, coming out of Ukraine, going through the southern Russian wheat belt over into Kazakhstan, has been exceptionally dry. So as we think about what will be planted here in terms of, of wheat, and then what we're going to be getting out of this air in terms of corn and soybean is going to be uh, impacted by this regional but uh, very rapidly evolving drought situation here toward uh, the, the, the last uh, 30 days or so. Lastly, uh, on our international tour here, I want to take you over to Asia, specifically to talk about how in the last week, not one, but two separate typhoons have gone through uh, the Korean Peninsula here into the Manchurian Plain, which is in northern China. Why we discuss this is because that particular region right in through here is a very productive area. Let me color that in black for you. There you go. A very productive area for growing a lot of crops in China. Remember that earlier in the year, all the flooding was in this area. Now we just hit this area hard with an additional four to ten inches of rainfall. With the stronger winds from the typhoon, we are also seeing quite a bit of damage. I know you're looking here at corn damage, but when we just think about the overall picture of what's happening in Europe, what's happening in Asia, and also what's happening in North America, there have been some pretty serious weather events that have put strain on global agriculture. So I want you just to keep an eye on these things as we press forward. From there, let's come back to Australia and talk about some forecasting accuracy. Over here on the right, Right. This is our last week's worth of precipitation as presented by BOM. Over here on the left, this is what I forecast two weeks ago to be the rainfall for last week. And overall, the European model, I've been quite impressed with its performance. It was calling for drier conditions in here with maybe just a little bit of 
rain here on the, the southeast coast of Queensland getting over into uh, a, Victor uh, a New South Wales, excuse me, and then also right down here in the corner down by Perth. And so I'm impressed overall with the performance of the European model. So let's take a look at the next week and what it is forecasting. We will have to watch for one frontal boundary to slide through here over the next seven days increasing precipitation. But overall, that's a relatively dry forecast. And there is increased shower activity again in the same places we saw it over the last week. Let's take a look at how this compares to normal. We once again do see drier conditions for most of South Australia, most of Western Australia, and in through parts of, of um, Queensland, Southern Queensland, and also New South. South Wales. It appears that that one front will slide right in through this area, increasing precipitation chances. To show you what that looks like, I'd like to go right over to the operational European model and pick out the timing on this event. So let's get this going and playing through the day here, uh, getting us uh, through the day. Here it is. This is Thursday, now getting into Friday. You're starting to see that frontal boundary stretch out here by Friday, such that once we get into the day on Saturday, it's really well established. So it's right in through there. This will be the area on which we can expect to be seeing some widely scattered showers as we enter the weekend. Going from Saturday in through Sunday, that's about it. You see, it's a really temporary shot at getting this rainfall. So our next seven days, that's about the only real significant chance because high pressure builds right back in right away after the weekend starting on Monday. But we're going to watch an interesting event take shape on Monday uh, that is coming down the coast here. So it might be bringing some scattered showers over to this part of Western Australia. But take a look at what happens midweek. You see that same low now pulls into this area by Tuesday. And then as we get into Wednesday and Thursday, I'll be curious to see as that low stretches here down toward you know, this side of Australia, look at the frontal boundary it leaves right in through this area. Now, as we go from Wednesday into Thursday, it appears that that particular region might start to develop its own kind of low pressure system. And as this big high builds in on the backside, next Thursday, getting into Friday, a low pressure cell begins to spin up right here in South Australia. Now, my question is, we're getting out pretty far with a single operational model run producing this low that potentially brings in some significant precipitation. So what is the likelihood of that happening? To answer that question, I'd like to show you the European model ensemble forecast for the time period of next Thursday. What this is, is this is 51 separate simulations and it's giving me pressure anomalies. What I'm seeing here is a pretty solid signal that that low pressure system could be moving through there. Again, the Thursday, the 17th, or possibly the evening of the 16th, getting then into the 17th and 18th. And that could, by chance, increase our precipitation probabilities. You see both the GFS model and the European model right now exclusively for week two, which leads up to the 23rd, are calling for wetter than average conditions. And the view that you see here from these models might be something we see quite a bit more as we progress through September and October and November. And I'd like to explain to you why as we finish up our video. First, temperatures. We do see that over the next five days, we favor warmer than average conditions except for along the coast. As we go out to days five through 10, it's a very similar story. But remember that uh, Thursday, Friday time period, the cooler weather will be coming in behind that low. You can just see though that it's not making a big impact on the five day average. That's what I'm wanting to point out to you. And then going out to days 10 through 15, still, I don't see anything pushing us toward sustained below average temperatures across the whole of Australia. Now, let's look out longer term here. What I've got on the top here is the week three forecast, which goes from September 21st through the 28th. And on the bottom, I have the week four forecast, which is going to go from the, uh, the, the 28th through October the 5th. Now, during those time periods, you can see the temperature anomalies in the graphics on the, on the left and the precipitation anomalies in the graphics on the right. And once again, we do see that the models are favoring that corridor, especially into week four, as being wetter. And we need to talk about what's driving this. So from the Bureau, what we've got here is the September 2020 probability of exceeding median rainfall. Okay, you've all seen this graphic. I want to supplement that with what we're getting from some of our models. It begins first with a quick discussion about the MJO. Now, the MJO at the end of August came out over here into phase one and two and then went here into phase three. And it's kind of been sitting and spinning between phases three, four and five, but almost right here in what we call the null phase. 
Now, what does all of that mean? Well, we can look at it again and understand that that means that over the next 15 days, our best rising motion in the atmosphere is going to be right here over this part of the Indian Ocean bordering on Indonesia. We can see it in this map here with these green colors. Suppressing motion in the atmosphere is largely going to be confined to the Pacific Ocean. There is some hint that the MJO is on the move, but right now I believe it's playing second fiddle here to uh, La Nina, and we better talk about La Nina. Right now, our ocean temperatures, you can see, uh, have expanded in terms of the, the cooler colors representing a strengthening La Nina. And just to put some numbers onto this, the ocean temperature index right here, Nina region 3.4, which is inside the box I'm shading here, is now down to negative 0.7 degrees Celsius. So that is firmly into La Nina territory. The trade winds denoted by these blue colors here represent that they're going to continue to stay strong and out of the east reinforcing this la nina like behavior not only through the month of september but likely into october and november as well you see the long range forecasts now shown to you brand new data here october november december have expanded that la nina and you can see from the new forecast from the bomb and this is also echoed by the european model and several other model agencies have this firmly into a moderate possibly even getting toward a stronger la nina event at the same time, look at what the Indian Ocean Dipole is forecast to do during the month of October. Most modeling centers are putting this over into the, uh, you know, the weak but negative territory for the Indian Ocean Dipole. When we think about the impacts of that, we can come here to the uh, bombs uh, forecast for October in terms of the probability of exceeding median rainfall. And you can see the wetter anomalies it is forecasting here, and that is echoed in the forecast produced by uh, the European model. Very similar setup here, wetter than average conditions moving into the month of October. This again is being dominated by the influence of the uh, developing La Nina. This is also echoed in the latest updates that come from the National Multimodel Ensemble. So these are seven different models that are run at major modeling centers in the United States and Canada, but you get a global forecast out of it. And you can once again see the green shading that represents wetter than average conditions here and also in the surrounding ocean to the north and over here to the east. That is telltale or characteristic La Nina-like behavior. And also notice the behavior picked up here by the negative phase of the IOD. That's a strong signal coming out of the National Multimodal Ensemble. From there, I just want to show you, and this will be my last two graphics, what we're looking at for November and December. The models are allowing the La Nina to be the most dominant signal as we move into these two months. So will you again see wetter conditions in through these areas. So this is going to be something that we're going to have to watch to see if the La Nina is truly going to be the dominant signal. At this point, it's certainly pointing that way. And I don't have strong evidence to go against that, which is the point that I'd like to make as I finish this up. I look forward to giving you another update in a couple of weeks. Until then, hope you'll have a great uh, mid part of September here. Okay. Thank you so much.